All right, so it's top of the hour. Um, a few participants will be trickling in as we get started. Um, but for the sake of time, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. This is the first of many presentations today. And if you would like to join us for next Saturday, registration will be available shortly after today. My name is Shayla Gutierrez. I'm the Garden Program Coordinator at Green Venture. And my colleague Bella is joining us today, as well as Sadula, our youth volunteer who will be monitoring the chat room. Green Venture's mission is to empower Hamiltonians to implement greener practices in their homes and daily lives and communities to make our city a climate champion. Helping individuals make their day-to-day -day lives greener to reduce emissions and working with Hamilton youth to drive climate action. Our efforts today are made possible by the support of Ward 8 Councilor John Paul Danko, Ward 1 Councillor Maureen Wilson's mm -hmm. office team, and the Hamilton Public Library and Mohawk Sustainability Office. We have a few housekeeping items for those that may be new to Zoom and are just joining in. All participants are on listen-only mode. Mics are turned off just to ensure the quality of sound of our recording and that we have good sound for today's session. We are recording today's session and we'll, it will be available for you at a later date. Throughout the session, we encourage you to use the chat box for any questions to be answered at the end of the presentation. And if for some reason technology is against us today, you will be placed in the waiting room and we'll be right back. If you are joining us for multiple presentations today, you will need to log on to the individual Zoom links that were sent out in the, in the reminder emails. We'd like to kick off today's event by recognizing that Green Ventures Eco House is on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabeg, and Ottawandran nations. Within the lands protected by the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Agreement, we acknowledge that Green Venture is also part of this agreement and are committed to being stewards of the land. We further acknowledge that this land is covered by the Between the Lakes Purchase 1792 between the Crown and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Today, the city of Hamilton is home to many indigenous peoples including the Métis and Inuit from across Turtle Island. We are committed to reconciliation and protecting the land for those who will inherit it. We recognize that we must do more to learn about the rich history of this land so that we can better understand our roles as residents, neighbors, partners, and caretakers. I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Bob Wildfong has been saving seeds and teaching seed saving techniques to gardeners and farmers for over 30 years. As the executive director of Seeds of Diversity, he helps seed savers across the country rescue and preserve thousands of rare heritage varieties of vegetables, grains, flowers, and herbs. He is also the horticulture specialist at the Dune Heritage Village Museum, where he restores and inter interprets period gardens of the turn of the last century. Before we get started, I have launched a poll to find out what is your level of experience with seed saving. So if you could just take a few minutes to answer what your level of experience before we get started. Great, so it looks like 50% uh, are new to it, about 40% are intermediate, and about 7% of the audience today is well seasoned. Wonderful. Bob, take it away. Oh, thank you very much. I'm going to um, stop my screen share now and you can take it away. There we go. So I'm talking today on um, how to grow and plan a successful seed saving garden. So a seed saving garden is one where obviously you will grow uh, some seeds that you can harvest and plant next year. Um, the idea of a seed saving garden is that you can have um, high quality seeds from flowers, vegetables, fruit, herbs, uh, anything that you might like to grow. Um, but ideally, you should also be able to grow lots of, of food there too. So you should not just have seeds, you should also have the vegetables and the fruit and the herbs and the flowers to enjoy as well. So how do you, how do, you do that? How do you go about it? And the, the, the uh, process actually starts right now because it's about planning. And we're going to go through um, 
first of all, talking about how the timing of seeds works. Seeds obviously grow at the end of a plant's life cycle. So think about how that affects when the food is ready and when the seeds are ready. And then we'll talk about um, how many plants do you need in order to get enough seeds? Um, some plants can give you lots of seeds. So how many plants do you have to grow for the seeds that you want? And then we'll actually, we'll, we'll, we'll chart it out. We'll make a plan of a, a seed saving garden and figure out where to put everything so it all works. So we're going to talk about the timing. I said that some, um, some seeds ripen earlier than others. The seeds always ripen at the end of the plant's life cycle. So, you know, plants sprout, they make leaves, they make stems, they make more leaves, they make flowers. Flowers make some kind of fruit or maybe a seed capsule or a pod, and that's where the seeds are. That's at the end of the whole growth. And at some point, you're going to want to use some of those plants for food. So how does that work into seed saving? Um, we're gonna talk about how many plants do you need? Um, some plants can make lots of seeds. Some plants don't make so many seeds. So how, how do you decide how many of your plants in your garden are for seeds and how many are for the food or, or the flowers? And in fact, some of them can be for both. So it's easy in some, it takes some thinking in others. And we'll also talk about how many plants you should keep seeds from in order to have a really healthy population of seeds. You can't just take your seeds from one plant. You have to take your seeds from more than one plant so that you get some, some genetic diversity in your seeds. And we'll talk about why that is and how to figure that out. And finally, like I said, we'll actually map out an example of a seed saving garden um, and, and basically go through the thought process that goes into planning your garden if you're thinking about seed saving. So we start off with the timing of it. How do you know when your seeds are ready? And the, the, uh, the fact is we have kind of two categories of seeds out there. Uh, about 95% of our plants make seeds um, that come kind of dry and brown when they're ready. So flower seeds come in seed capsules, uh, beans and peas come in um, in pods, and you have to wait for the pods to turn brown and dry. That's when the seeds are ready. Uh, you'll find um, there are uh, all, all sorts of shapes and sizes of uh, seed heads and capsules and pods and the different kinds of, uh, of, of ways that the seeds are, are ripened. But in 95% of the cases, you're waiting for the seeds to turn brown and dry on the plant. And you can't pick them early and expect them to just sort of ripen. They have to be fed by the plant. So they have to turn brown and dry right there on the plant before you harvest them. The other 5% uh, of our plants make seeds in uh, a soft fruit. So think of tomatoes, or there's a picture of watermelon here. Uh, it's been a long time since a lot of people have seen watermelon with seeds in it, right? Well, I grow watermelon with seeds in it because then I can save the seeds. Uh, and uh, maybe my kids know about spitting watermelon seeds into a bowl more than most other kids do. I think that's cool. Um, also think about things like peppers, uh, melons, eggplants. Those are the kinds of, of uh, seeds that come in a soft fruit. Generally, we wait for that fruit to be fully ripe at the time when the seeds are ready. So if you want ripe tomato seeds, you wait for the tomato to be ripe. You want ripe uh, squash seeds, you wait for the squash to be fully ripe. But funny thing is that that only makes up about 5% of all of our plants. Most of them come in the dry and brown seed form. Um, so for example, tomato, um, tomato seeds are ripe when the fruit is ripe. And so this is really easy. You pick a tomato, you chop it up to make a salad, and while you're at it, scoop a few seeds out. It doesn't take uh, very many seeds uh, to plant for next year. Um, but the point is that the timing of it is that the seeds will be ripe at the same time as the, the tomato is ripe. So it's really quite simple. It's a little bit more complicated with something like beans, that's one of those 95% where the seeds are ripe when the bean pod has turned brown and dry. It's kind of papery. When you, when you bend it, it makes a crinkly kind of sound when it's ripe. That's when you'll find the ripe seeds inside. But if you pick a green bean or a yellow bean, that's much, much earlier. That's about four weeks uh, before the, the seeds will be actually ripe. So sometimes you'll pick some uh, beans just to eat fresh, green and yellow, you know, or purple uh, pod beans. Um, 
yeah, they obviously have no seeds in there, right? When you eat them, the seeds are really, really tiny. They're not ripe at all. You have to wait for another four weeks. So you'll let other pods ripen all the way. Can you let them uh, do both of those things on the same plant? Well, sure, you can pick some green or yellow or purple pods from one plant and let other pods on the same plant ripen all the way. You could let maybe all the pods on some plants ripen and eat all the pods on the other plants. However you do it, uh, it's good to think through that those two different uses for those pods are going to be four weeks apart in time and in terms of how long they're going to be in the garden and how long you're going to have to look after the plants that those pods are on. Okay. Um, it gets even a little bit um, more of planning involved with this plant. Like if you have a second to think of what is this anyway, this is lettuce. So this is what happens to lettuce about a month and a half after you'd ordinarily eat it. Um, you've probably had the experience if you've grown lettuce in your garden and you let it grow a little bit too long, it starts to get kind of tall. Um, it grows a stem. And by that point, the leaves get tough and bitter. They even have a kind of a white sap inside them, which is really bitter. They're no good to eat anymore. A lot of people pull up their lettuce at that point. They say it bolted is the word we use. It means it's starting to grow a flower stem. And if you let it grow, it grows about three or four feet tall and it has yellow flowers. And the yellow flowers, just like dandelions, they turn into this white fluffy kind of seed head. And every one of those uh, little seed heads will have about 15 seeds inside. So let me just go back. That's what it looks like six weeks after you'd ordinarily eat the lettuce. You can't eat this, it's, it's not edible. And yet if you eat the lettuce, uh, it, it, it won't grow up into, into these seeds. So it's a, uh, it's a case where you will grow some lettuce plants for eating and some lettuce plants for seeds. You can use beans for both and tomatoes are easy to use for both, but lettuce, it's one or the other. So um, with tomatoes, you're waiting for the end of the season, harvesting your tomatoes, harvesting your seeds at the same time, simple. With beans, you're probably eating some at the uh, that nice fresh pod stage about four to six weeks after you plant the seeds. And then you're letting other uh, pods ripen for another four weeks until they have the mature seeds that's in the top right. That's what you find inside the, uh, the, the fully brown dried um, seed pods. Those are your seeds. Now, those, those are also food, right? If you're growing your beans for dried beans for making chili or soup, then the seed and the food are the same thing and they both ripen at the, at the very end of the season at the same time. So that's also easy, right? But lettuce is the one that we'll be, um, we'll be making some different decisions on that when we get into our example, because like I said, some lettuce plants you'll grow just for seed and some you'll grow just for food because you can't use them both at the same time. If you, if you wait too long to get the seeds, you can't eat it anymore. And if you eat the lettuce when it's good to eat, you can't get seeds out of it because the lettuce is gone. How many plants would you keep for, for saving seeds? So the lettuce is a good example. How many of those plants, if they're just for seed, how many should you grow for seed? Well, here's a handful of lettuce seeds um, that I got from just one plant. So yeah, some plants will grow lots of seeds. Every one of those flowers on the lettuce plant will give you about 15 seeds. It's like a dandelion head, you know, a bunch of seeds underneath the fluff. And I would say there could be about a hundred um, flowers on every plant. So, wow, one seed makes one lettuce plant and that lettuce plant makes 1,500 seeds. <laughs> so that's a lot, um, but you should grow more than that. You shouldn't just grow one lettuce plant for, um, for seed. It's better to grow uh, quite a few, like even, even 15 or 20, if you have room for that. And you can put them pretty close together. The reason is that, so, that plants need uh, some variety within them. You can't just take seeds from one plant and expect to get a good variety year after year. You have to get an assortment of, uh, of genetics from a, a number of different plants. And we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that. Another consideration is the pollination. Um, not all um, plants are able to pollinate themselves and 
sometimes plants really need to have neighbors in order to, to uh, pollinate successfully. So let's look at a few examples of this. If we're taking seeds out of a tomato, I would say take seeds out of at least five different tomatoes, not all, all the same one. And the difference is that there will be genetic differences between each one, even though you can't really tell. It's worth it to, to, um, to diversify a little bit instead of just keeping your seeds from the one. Uh, this is a German giant tomato. It's a really nice, um, big old fashioned heirloom tomato. It's delicious and it looks really cool. And uh, if you notice, it doesn't have very many seeds compared to other varieties. There are, I mean, there are lots of seeds there. There are probably a, a hundred or so seeds in, in every tomato, which is plenty, but it's, uh, it's a lot less seedy than some varieties are. I would say that this is a, a really nice tomato for making something like sauce because you can just grind it up and you can hardly tell the seeds are in there. There are so few. Um, but imagine if you were running a seed company, would this be a good variety if you were trying to get lots of seeds to sell? And the fact is you'd have to grow a lot more of these tomatoes to get the same number of seeds as another variety. And that's, that's the main reason why this is hard to find. It's a, a, a difficult to find heirloom um, that you don't find in very many seed catalogs. And the reason is it's not very profitable for a seed company. And yet it's a great tomato for a gardener. So to me, this is a perfect candidate for seed saving. Save your own seeds from this one. It's a fantastic tomato. It's called German Giant or sometimes striped German Giant. It's hard to find, but when you get it, you can just keep your own seeds. This is how you do it. Just take a few seeds from uh, each tomato and uh, every seed is covered with a little bit of jelly. That, that slippery stuff that's around all the seeds, you can just rub that off and get the seeds clean. Um, the purpose of the jelly is to keep the seed from germinating. It, it, it prevents germination. Uh, and that in fact is so that the seeds don't actually sprout inside the tomato because they would, right? To, to seeds grow when they're warm and moist. And if they're warm and moist inside the tomato, they would just sprout. And, uh, and I've actually seen this where, where uh, it, it happens sometimes where you'll slice open a tomato and find hundreds of little tiny sprouts inside there. It's crazy. Um, and in fact, I have also dried the uh, tomato seeds that you see over on the left with the, with the jelly around them, just dried them. And when I, I planted them, only about one out of 10 grew. But if I rub the jelly off, then 10 out of 10 grow. So it really does matter to clean it off. It's also nicer. Um, but that's it. That's, that's saving tomato seeds. Take it from, you know, take seeds from more than one tomato and uh, keep them dry and you can plant them next year. They should last for about five years if you keep them nice and dry. And that's that. Um, it's a, a different thing with lettuce. You can get, like I said, about 15 seeds from every seed head uh, from, the, from the white fluffy seed heads over on the right. Um, I would say you could plant a number of lettuce, like maybe 10 or 15 um, lettuces for seed and get all the seed that you want for all the seedy Saturdays in Ontario. They, there, there could be a lot there, but it's a good idea to pick some, uh, some lettuce seed from a few different plants and not just, just from the one. Um, make sure that you have a, uh, uh, a, a good, um, good soil because the, the seeds will grow, or sorry, the plants will grow quite tall. They will grow about three or four feet tall and uh, they need to have a good, good soil to, to root in. Um, but lettuce grows very reliably, especially in a hot summer, and uh, it's very easy to save the seeds. That's what they look like. I get just a little bit of, uh, of fluff in my lettuce seeds usually. It's kind of hard to clean it out, but the, if you still have a little bit of fluff there, that won't hurt anything. Um, I usually just put this in a paper envelope and let it dry, and then I have no problem growing the lettuce seed the next year or even a few years later on. And this, what do you think this is? You can probably tell from the picture on the left, it's spinach. And the picture on the right is also spinach. That's what it looks like when it goes to seed. Now this is the one that um, you should grow with a few neighboring spinach plants. If you, uh, if, if, first of all, if you've ever grown spinach in the middle of the summer comes along, usually when it's very hot, um, spinach can, 
grow a, a flower stem. They call it bolting, just like with lettuce. So the spinach bolts in the heat. Um, and the leaves are usually still kind of good to eat for a little while, but once the, that stem grows about a foot tall, um, the, the leaves tend to get a little smaller and, and a little tougher. Uh, and most people pull their spinach up then and they say, oh, it's no good anymore. And they, and, and they just plant something else. But that's when you can get more seeds. If you just let it grow, let it grow taller, um, you will get hundreds and hundreds of seeds. They're the little green, light green balls along the stem on that plant, uh, the, the left-hand one in the picture on the right. Those are all seeds. There are about a hundred seeds on that plant. They have to turn brown and dry. So they're not ripe yet here, but eventually they turn, they turn brown. You just strip them off and you can even plant them again and get a second crop of spinach in the same year. Now, here's the trick is that the plant on the, on the right doesn't have any seeds on it. It has a different kind of flower that only makes pollen. And the plant on the left, that's the one with the seeds on it. So um, spinach pollinates by one plant making pollen that's really dusty and light and blows around in your garden. And it has to land, the pollen has to land exactly on the other plant's seeds in order to fertilize them. So if you only have a few lettuce, or sorry, spinach plants, the chance of that pollen landing just exactly where it has to be is kind of small. It, if you want spinach seeds, it's much better to have several plants, as many as you can, and not all just out in a row, even if they're in a block or a circle, so that whichever way the wind blows, the pollen is likely to land on another spinach plant. And that way you'll get more pollination and you'll get, you'll get good seeds that way. So this is where if you're going to let some spinach plants go to seed, don't just let one or two do that. Um, you should let at least 10 or, or about a dozen do that. Even if you don't need that many seeds, uh, if, if you don't have enough of these plants all going to, to, to flower at the same time, you won't get any seeds at all. So here's a funny word, roguing. Have you ever heard of roguing in the garden? Is it something that is really important in seed saving, but we haven't talked about it very much uh, before. And uh, uh, it's, it's high time that it became something that seed savers thought about uh, much more. What it means is removing any plants that are, uh, are uh, different than the variety that you're trying to preserve. So if you're growing a particular kind of lettuce or a particular kind of bean and you see in that group of plants that there's one plant that's quite different from the others, then roguing is the practice of removing that plant in order to uh, keep all of the other plants uniform. So when you save the seeds, you get the seeds that you expect. Now, that means you're, you're going to have fewer plants if you do have to remove some. So what I always do is if I think, well, I should let maybe say 10 plants grow for seeds, I'll actually let 12 grow for seeds just in case I have to remove a few. It's always good to add about 10 or 20% to the number that you expect to save the seeds from just in case you have to remove some. And I have a bunch of examples here. Here's a, a, a cabbage. I was growing this uh, rare heirloom variety of cabbage called Houston's Evergreen. Um, it's, uh, it's very difficult to replace. There are only a few um, places where you can get the seeds. And in this row of cabbage, um, which are all nice round, sort of like cannonball, perfectly round cabbages, I found this one that's kind of flat and, and wide. It's called a drumhead shape. It's, uh, it's, it's wide and, and kind of flat instead. And I don't know how that got there. I don't know how uh, that totally different kind of cabbage wound up in my Houston seeds, but it did. So I, I ate that one. Um, I'll save the other ones for seed, but uh, I, I, I don't want that one to be in with my very rare kind of, uh, of cabbage because it, uh, it, it, it will cross with the other uh, cabbages in the row. Um, here are some lettuces. On the left, there's a, uh, a variety called all year round. It's called that because it, uh, it's really good for growing in a greenhouse or a cold frame in the cold part of the year, all year round, really nice. But I found that the one at the top of the picture, this is on the left, um, it bolted much earlier than the others. See, it's already quite taller than the others. Do I save seeds from a, a lettuce that bolts early? Because if I do, it means more of those lettuces next year will bolt early. And I, 
I, I really don't want that. I want I want to prevent early bolting. So it's a good idea to remove any uh, lettuces that that uh, that go to seed earlier than the others. Um, that means I have fewer remaining for seed saving. So when I think about how many plants do I need to reserve for seed, I'm not going to eat these lettuces. I'm going to let them all grow to seed. I should add a few in case there are some that I have to remove. That's the point of this. Over on the right uh, is a, an oak leaf lettuce, but there's one close to the top that's quite different from the others. And here's a, here's a closer picture. Um, it's a, a different shape, it has some red in it. Um, the, uh, it's, it's a totally different kind of lettuce. I don't know how it got there, but I don't want it to cross pollinate with my other lettuces. So I caught it just in time that it was still edible. I had that one for a salad that evening. Um, but this is just an example of the sort of thing that we, we mean by, by roguing, removing um, off types. It's good to just expect that you might need a few more plants than you originally thought. And a word on the population size. I, I've come to this a few times talking about how many plants you should have uh, for saving seed. Um, the reason for it is that we've made all of our, say, lettuces look the same. The same color, the same shape, the leaves look the same, they have the same kind of texture and flavor, but there are lots of things in these lettuces that we can't see that are different. So things like, um, say, drought tolerance, maybe one of these lettuces has a much more efficient root system and it's able to withstand dry weather better than the others. If I save seeds from only one plant, how do I know that I've caught that, that one really important characteristic that's it's still different from one lettuce because we haven't we haven't been able to make them all uniform. They're all they're all uniform in ways that we can see, but they're not uniform in the ways we can't see. And that's why we collect seeds from more than one lettuce to capture all of those beneficial properties that are in the population, but they're not in every individual. They're different from one individual to another. It's good to save seeds from as many as many plants as you can, and it depends on how much space you have, and it depends on how much, uh, you know, how, how many different kinds of plants you want in your garden, how much space you have, all sorts of variables that constrain how many plants you can save your seeds from. But as many as you can is the point. And I think some of you, uh, according to the poll, have uh, probably learned all about pollination, but I'll go through it quickly. I know some of you probably, uh, this is new. Um, so there are three kinds of pollination and this is really important for uh, planning out your garden when we, when we think about how far apart to put different varieties of the same species. So two different kinds of tomato, two different kinds of bean, how far apart should we plant them? The reason is that there are um, uh, insects and wind that will carry pollen from one plant to another. So we group our plants into three different categories so we can think about them more easily. Um, there are self-pollinating plants that basically the flowers just pollinate themselves. And in general, we can put those kinds of plants kind of closer to other varieties of the same kind, like two tomato varieties can go pretty close together without pollinating each other because their flowers pollinate themselves. Uh, as opposed to cross-pollinating plants where insects or wind will carry pollen back and forth over some distance and we have to keep those plants farther apart from other varieties so that we can uh, control the pollination. With self-pollinating plants, it's because the, the, the flowers are all closed up. So the, um, the tomato flower over on the left uh, and in the middle, there's a, a bumblebee who's trying to get pollen out of this flower. So the tomato flower is all kind of closed up. And upside down like this, the bumblebee can actually shake that flower and shake some pollen out from the very tip. But that's the only part that's open, just a little hole at the tip. So she's kind of using it like a salt shaker, trying to get pollen out, and she'll eat that pollen because it's really good food for bees. And you can imagine, could you shake salt back up into the salt shaker? Maybe you could. It's really hard though, right? So this is what this is what the situation is with tomatoes. If you have different kinds, say a red tomato and a yellow tomato growing pretty close to each other, bumblebees will do this. They'll gather pollen from those tomato flowers, but they'll shake the, the pollen out. Every now and then, maybe a grain of pollen on her belly will kind of work its way back up into a flower, but it's like putting salt back into a salt shaker. Um, 
So it hardly ever happens. That's why we can have um, more than one kind of tomato pretty close together. And when we save the seeds, they, they stay the same as their parents. They don't cross pollinate. Uh, the bean flower, or that's a pea flower over on the right. Uh, that's the same kind of situation, bean, pea flowers, they're very tightly closed up. Lettuce flowers are, are self-pollinating too. And so these four, the tomato, bean, pea, and lettuce will be in our example of, uh, of self-pollinating flowers. Um, these flowers, these are squash flowers, they're wide open. Our friend the bee here is carrying pollen back and forth from flower to flower. And how far can squash get pollinated? Squash or zucchini or pumpkins can be pollinated or cross-pollinated as far as a bee can fly. So if bees are flying to your garden and your neighbor's garden and down the street and a block over and moving pollen back and forth from flower to flower, then you can't know um, when you save seeds from your squash or your pumpkins, you can't know whether it's been crossed with some other squash or pumpkin or zucchini somewhere in the neighborhood. And that becomes much more complicated. Wind pollination is even harder because the, in this case, the pollen will go as far as the wind does, and that can be miles and miles. Um, it's particularly difficult with corn. Um, corn pollen can blow for miles. Uh, it's not so much, such a problem with, um, with small amounts of spinach. Uh, the spinach pollen kind of close to the ground tends to land on the ground around your spinach and not so much blowing between different neighbors. Um, but it is, it is possible uh, if you had a lot of spinach making lots of pollen that it could travel some distance, but usually people have small amounts. So that one is still, uh, I would say it's up in the air and I do intend the pun on that. So, um, We've, we're, we're going to talk about how to plan out a seed garden and where to put these plants in, in the garden based on how far apart they need to be to prevent them from crossing. And what we've done is uh, we have two different kind of standards for separating our plants. We, we talk, first of all, let's talk about commercial uh, isolation. That's the second number in, in, these, uh, in these examples. Um, if you're running a seed company, growing seeds uh, to sell, then you have to aim for a really high quant quality. Um, the, the quality that uh, commercial seeds aims for is like 99.8% uniform. And that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty strict. Good, because we want our commercial seeds to be really high quality. We want them to be um, just, just what it says on the package label. And you don't have a bunch of funny off types in there. So if you're growing tomatoes, for sale for a seed company, we would advise to plant different kinds 15 meters apart from each other and beans six meters apart. And that sounds, that sounds like a lot. It's, that's a long way. If you're growing in a backyard garden, um, that's too much. Right? You don't have room for that. So um, we also have uh, a stand, we, we publish these, these standards as, as advice for you that um, for community use, that means for your own use, for saving seeds that you would share at a CD Saturday for saving seeds that you'd give to your friends. And you want them to be pretty good. You don't want to hand out seeds that are terrible, but you, you would like them to be achievable too. Well, five meters apart for different kinds of tomatoes and three meters apart for different kinds of beans will give you good quality seeds. You might find one out of 30, one out of 40 might have a, a, a cross. They might not be quite what uh, what you expect them to be, but that's pretty good for your own use. I think it's good for my own use anyway. Um, if you're selling the seeds, that's a whole different thing. And so that's where, where our, our difference between our different isolation standards comes. Uh, you can find out more about that, um, but I'll, uh, I'll get onto this example because we're, we've talked about how to get the timing right. We've talked about how many seeds we need. Now let's, let's map out a, an example of a seed saving garden. So here is an example of a, of a garden. Your garden is totally different than this one, of course. So this is really just meant to show the, the kind of thought process that goes in. Um, my plan here won't fit your garden, but hopefully I can get across the way to think about it, okay? Um, so I like to think first of all in feet instead of meters too. So this is 23 feet by 10 feet, but we'll, we'll talk in, in, uh, in meters. Each of these squares is a meter. And I have to figure out how to put these eight kinds of plants across the top so that they're separated by the right distances. I want 
a red and a yellow tomato. I want a green and uh, a yellow bean. I have two kinds of peas and a, a green and a red lettuce. And the tomatoes have to be five meters apart and the beans and the peas and the lettuces have to be three meters apart. The different kinds that is have to be that far apart. So how will I do this? The first thing I realize is that the tomatoes have to be a little further than the others. And there's only one place where they can get five meters in between them. So I'll put the tomatoes on either end of my garden. Now there's five, there are five squares in between, that's five meters. So they should be good. Great. So let's do the same thing with the beans. I'll put my yellow beans over on the left and my green beans over on the right. There are three squares in between. So that they're, they're three meters apart. I can save the seeds from all of these plants and they're not crossing with any other kinds. Super. But now I can really run into problem because if I put the peas here, then they're only one meter apart. And that means you can save pea seeds that are grown right next to each other, but you may find that some of them will be a little bit hybridized. So when you plant the green peas next year, some of them might come up purple. Well, if that's okay with you, go right ahead. But if you want to tell somebody that they're green peas and that they are what they what, what it says in the label, then that's the whole point of this uh, of this exercise is to separate them by enough distance so they don't cross pollinate. So okay, so let's 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 uh, let's back up. What if I take the peas out, and what if I move the green beans over, move them over here? Okay, so now, now they're kind of like two meters over from the, the yellow beans now, right? Except if I measure from the middle of the row to the middle of the row, then one, two, three, they're kind of like three meters apart. Maybe it's more like two and a half. So it's sort of cheating, uh, but I can do the same thing with the peas. Now they're kind of kind of far enough apart, sort of, but I don't have room for the lettuce. So this is just not working. So I'm gonna try something different. Let's go back to the tomatoes because that worked. Tomatoes are, are far enough apart. This is take two. Where should I put my beans and my peas? What if I do this? What if I put them on these corners? Okay, so the yellow beans, green beans, green peas, and the, and the purple peas are in these squares and the, the the gray borders, those are the squares where I'm going to save seeds, okay? Those are just for seed saving. And they're far enough apart from each other. Then I'll do this. So can you see what I've done here? I've, I've sort of mirror imaged it vertically and put them close to. So these yellow beans are far enough away from my seed saving green beans. That's, that's three meters, pretty close. And the same is true with all the other ones. So the idea is that I'm just gonna eat the, the beans and the peas that are in the middle here and save seeds from the ones that are in the, the uh, gray rectangles, okay? So I can eat some, I can save seeds from others, but the seed saving ones are far enough away from all the others that it will still work. Now, what if I put the lettuces in here? And I can see that if I save the seeds from the green lettuces way over on the left and save seeds from the red lettuces way over on the right, that they're three meters apart. So that should work. But wait a minute, now you're going to say, what about the lettuce in the middle? That green lettuce right in the very, very middle is only a meter away from my seed saving red lettuce, but that's not a problem because I won't let that bolt. I won't let that go to seed. If I only eat the lettuces, the three lettuces in the middle, don't let them go to seed, then they won't cross because I'm taking advantage of the timing thing. The tomatoes, I have to wait for the tomatoes to fully ripen before I get the seeds and the food. With the beans, I have to let them fully ripen to get the seeds, but I also have to let them flower in order to get the, uh, the pods, the green and, and uh, yellow pods for eating. So either way they have to flower, but I don't have to let the lettuce flower before I eat it. So I can put non-flowering lettuce, just eating lettuce, as close as I want to the flowering lettuce. It won't cross because it doesn't make flowers. That's how I do it. 
And I get these two spaces where I can put something else. Maybe I can put some spinach or some herbs or something like this. And after I've eaten the lettuce, I'll have room here for planting something else. If I plant my lettuce in say late April, that lettuce should be ready to eat by sometime in June. And June is plenty early enough for me to plant something else behind it. I have to let the seed lettuce on either end grow all the way till the end of the season to get the seeds. It needs six more weeks than the eating lettuce. But once the eating lettuce is eaten, I have those six weeks to grow something else in that spot. So this is, this is kind of how I think it all through. In fact, I could plant some cabbage there. I could, uh, if it's June, maybe I could get some um, peppers that I've grown indoors and plant them and still bring them to maturity by September. There's lots of things I can do with that middle space. So that's, that's kind of the thought process that I go through all the time, planning out how to grow seeds in my garden and still be able to get good produce like lettuce. It's all about how far apart, thinking about the timing and thinking about how many plants I need in order to, uh, to get the number of seeds that I'd like. So um, you can find out lots more information from Seeds of Diversity. We have uh, a, a seed finder on our website, which is a catalog index of all the seed catalogs in Canada. So if you're looking for any particular varieties uh, and they're sold in Canada, we know where. Um, and we use this in particular to, uh, to figure out which varieties are um, difficult to find. Like I mentioned, the, the cabbage that I was growing and some of those lettuces are, are and, the, and the German giant tomato. They're very uh, uh, interesting and good varieties, but for one reason or another, they're not carried by seed companies. Our mission as an organization, uh, Seeds of Diversity, is to promote um, saving the seeds of, uh, of rare varieties so that those varieties can keep on being grown. And we exchange those seeds through a member seed exchange. You can find out about that. You can get uh, all kinds of, uh, of uh, seed varieties that you can't buy from seed catalogs by getting them directly from Seed Savers. And that's what our organization is all about. So now I'd be really happy to answer any questions that anybody has, and uh, I thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. You created some really strong visual.